Hello, everyone. It's great to be here today, even though it's not in person. I'm glad that you guys have made it to Milan No-Till 2022. My name is Autumn McLaughlin. I'm a PhD student under Dr. Heather Kelly. And today, if you'll lend me your ears, I'd like to talk to you about identifying corneal ear rots and managing mycotoxins. Corn ear rots are diseases that are caused by a few different fungi that can colonize the, the ears or the kernels. And just like the name states, they break down these kernels, causing them to rot, leading to poor grain quality, lower test weights, and mycotoxin contamination. Today, we are going to be going over on how to ID and manage some of these significant corn ear rots in Tennessee. But before we get into these specifics on ID, I'd like to highlight our pest triangle for these pathogens. Because each one of these pieces in this triangle uh, or this pyramid have to be present for a disease like corn ear rots to occur. Here at the top in orange, we have the pathogen. This is what causes the disease. The disease, which um, in this case is the fungi. This can be inoculum that might be in, present in the field. Then we have a susceptible host. This is the crop in which the pathogen can infect. And the last two pieces are important for ear rots in particular. Many ear rots or the pathogens that cause the rots occur around the same time, which is highlighted in red, um, which is the R1 or uh, at or after silking stage. However, ear rot pathogens have different environmental conditions that may be present at or around R1 in order to cause infection. So what are mycotoxins and why do they matter? Mycotoxins are toxic secondary compounds produced by fungi. These compounds are very difficult to eliminate due to their stability in the environment. That being said, not all uh, mycotoxins um, or not all ear rots produce mycotoxins. Though the fungi that do produce mycotoxins, uh, like the three that I have highlighted up here on the screen, aflatoxin, Dawn, uh, or vomitoxin, and then fumonisin, the FDA has actually set guidelines for that being um, advisory thresholds or levels that are believed by the FDA to provide safety to human and animal health. Advisory thresholds are set for uh, fumonisin and vomitoxin only. And then action thresholds are precise levels of contamination at which the regulatory action may be taken. And the only alpha tox or the only mycotoxin known today with an action threshold would be our alpha toxin. These thresholds are different for each mycotoxin and uh, what the end use for the grain will be. So here's just a little overview of what rots we're going to be going over today. Um, so we're going to start off with our Aspergillus ear rot. Uh, this is caused by Aspergillus species, which is the most common um, pathogen that we usually see in Tennessee is Aspergillus flavus. Looking back to the pest triangle that I mentioned a little bit earlier, Aspergillus ear rot is what I'd like to call our hot rot. It is the hottest one on our list. That being that the favorable conditions for this disease is it, uh, it really likes hot temperatures, uh, 86 or above, um, and being more severe in drought situations. When you have these conditions, you will need to check your ears for yellow to olive green patches of spores on and between the kernels which usually has been seen at the top of the year. And you can see here in this photo um, that the, there's insect damage, specifically this is Southwestern corn borer damage, and the Aspergillus has uh, colonized this insect's uh, feeding and you can see the dusty spores on it. So now that we've gotten to know Aspergillus ear rot and the pathogens that cause the disease, let's talk about its associated mycotoxin. So this is known as aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is a known carcinogen that is highly toxic to humans and animals, leading to the FDA to set that action threshold that I mentioned. Um, it was set in 1969 for 20 parts per billion for human and animal consumption. And then thereafter, it was revised uh, for some feed groups, as you can see on the chart, which is swine, beef cattle, and chickens. The yield penalty for Aspergillus era is 
often associated with drought and therefore it's very difficult to estimate the damage. However, the fungus uh, or the fungi aspergillus can reduce kernel weight, though very often um, the pathogen itself has little impact on yield. And that can be said for a few other of these cornea rot pathogens that I'm going to mention today. The majority of concern for this disease um, and the others would definitely be our mycotoxins, and in this case, alpha toxin that can be produced, which can impact the grain quality and markability. And if it exceeds action thresholds, can lead to uh, rejection at grain bins. Best management practices for ear rots really start uh, prior to planting because little can be done to protect the ears after infection prior to post harvest strategies. Things that you can do if you had asper uh, aspergillus or aflatoxin uh, last year is to plan on planting corn. Um, is really need to start with your hybrid selection. Currently, there are no commercial hybrids that are resistant to aspergillus infection, though there are some hybrids available that have some tolerance to these ear rots. Also, hybrids that are more drought tolerance, in this case for aspergillus, because we talked about drought conditions are favorable for this disease. Uh, if you have a drought tolerant uh, hybrid, that would be better in situations that you're worried about aspergillus ear rot and alpha toxin. The next two strategies I know are not always possible in all situations, but are worth mentioning. If you're in continuous corn, think about avoiding corn. Um, if you know you've had a problem with aspergillus ear rot last year, and then tillage, uh, which is a, a way to break up and bury that inoculum in the field. The biggest thing you want to do with aspergillus ear rot and really all rots uh, that I'm going to be mentioning today is reducing that plant stress, which is easier said than done. But in this case, sorry, that that's my dog, um, <laughs> would be things like irrigation. Aspergillus, like I said, likes hot, dry conditions. So if it's under irrigation, you usually get less aspergillus ear rot and alpha toxin. But also things like proper soil fertility, planting in a good seed bed, uh, not compacted, timely nitrogen applications, as well as weed management, foliar disease management, and insect management. Um, if you keep your plant healthy, uh, it usually keeps your ear rods at bay. Um, there's also a biological control product on the market that can be applied at V10 for aspergillus ear rot called Alphagard. Uh, this is a non-toxigenic species of aspergillus that outcompetes um, the toxigenic species in the field. Uh, this is there's been really good results in um, mitigation of alpha toxin. And if you'd like to ask any questions at the end, we have our emails for that. Um, the next ear rot we have on the list is Fusarium ear rot. This is caused by actually a few Fusarium species, the most common being Fusarium verticaciles and proliferatum. Fusarium ear rot is little more common year to year in Tennessee as uh, the favorable conditions have a wide range, but usually it's most severe within high temperatures above 77, though it does like uh, more moisture than our aspergillus ear rot. For symptoms of this disease, you get a white cottony or an orangish purple mold that will be randomly uh, distribu distributed on the kernels uh, all over the ear. And infected kernels can be brown or have white streaks known as the starburst pattern, which I've got blown up in this picture of these kernels. You can see that kind of looks like they're the kernels of first, and that's where that uh, fungus is actually growing underneath, um, and that's called our starburst pattern. The mycotoxins that are associated with fusarium ear rots are known as fumonisins, which are toxic to, hu uh, to, to animals, extremely toxic uh, to horses and swine. Fumonisin has also been linked to increasing cancer rates and other hu human health problems. However, the evidence is still debatable. Uh, so with that, the FDA only has advisory threshold based on intended use. 
Like aspergillus ear rot, yield penalty for fusarium ear rot is more often due to the mycotoxin produced. In this case, it's fumonisin. Hybrid selection for fu uh, fusarium ear rot differs a little bit uh, from the aspergillus ear rot. Once again, there are no commercial hybrids that uh, is resistant to fusarium ear rot, but there are hybrids that have more tolerance. We, we recommend picking um, a hybrid that has an above six in their rating, depending on uh, their rating scale. Um, selecting a BT hybrid that gives production from ear feeding insect is a good option for fusarium ear rot. Uh, that being that um, fusarium ear rot is more correlated with uh, insect damage than our aspergillus ear rot. Um, aspergillus ear rot is kind of variable in its response to BC, BT hybrid insect protection. However, we know that most of our growers are actually growing BT crops. Uh, so uh, just just keep in your mind that um, this may help for your fumonisin and your fusarium ear rot. However, it's it's not a doesn't track as well for our aspergillus and aflatoxin uh, in terms of BT. Um, added to the field management section, and this one is crop protection uh, rotation, particularly to soybean or cotton. Rotating one of these crops uh, with corn will help reduce the overall inoculum in your field, um, not just the ear rot pathogen. Just keep in mind that many of these fusarium pathogens can be seedling disease in cotton or soybean. So a seed treatment in fields with high occurrence of rot is actually recommended. And I'm gonna harp again, once again, on the, the plant stressors. Um, in this case, irrigation isn't uh, a great practice to keep our fusarium ear rot at bay. Because like, again, I said they, fusarium ear rot likes a little more moisture. So in irrigated fields, we can actually see fusarium ear rot and fumonisin still pop up. So our next up on the list is our gibberella ear rot caused by fusarium uh, graminearium. We talked about our hot rots. Now we're getting to our cooler condition loving rots. Uh, gibberella ear rot is more severe under cool and wet conditions. Again, after our R1 stage, you start getting this reddish mold at the tip of the ear. This is very symptomatic of our um, gibberella ear rot that, and it starts to kind of grow downward. That growth will be from the tip to the starting down. Um, you actually, that reddish color uh, and another symptom that you might see is gibberella stock rot. This is still caused by the same pathogen. Um, and you'll start seeing that, that red in, within the stalk. And so gibberella ear rot is actually not asso is associated with two mycotoxins. These usually occur at the same time. We got the vomitoxin that I mentioned earlier, and then zeralinone which is, may, today I'm gonna mainly focus on our, our vomitoxin, our DON for this talk. Um, the DON, while not, knowing to be, while not known to be carcinogenic, the cleverly known vomitoxin uh, actually makes the, the, the animal vomit. So animals may refuse to consume feed and regurgitate grains contaminated with this vomitoxin. The consumption of vomitoxin, also zeleronone, may cause infertility and abortion in animals and uh, also some other breeding issues. However, right now there are only advisory thresholds set for the vomitoxin. As for the other uh, two ear rots, um, Fusarium graminearium can lead to reduced kernel weight, and if contaminated, toxins may not be suitable for feed uses. So once again, with the, our less susceptible hybrids, um, especially if you're something we need to think about at this one, especially with rotation, uh, that fusarium um, head blight is actually the pathogen that causes fusarium head blight in wheat also causes our gibberella ear rot uh, in corn. So we, we want you to be keeping that in mind when you thought, thinking about uh, putting fields from wheat to corn because uh, you're gonna have 
usually an increased inoculum load. So uh, stay out of wheat if possible, especially if you know you've got uh, fusarium headlight and kind of vice versa. And then once again, ma uh, managing our plant stresses. Last but not least, we've got Diplodia ear rot, which is caused by Sterniocarpella matus and uh, Microspora. This disease may sound familiar because uh, Microspora is the primary cause for our foliar disease that we see here in Tennessee, Diplodia leaf streak. Um, however, it can also cause uh, Diplodia ear rot. Diplodia really likes wet conditions during and uh, during silking and continuously after a wet season. You may spot infected ears before even pulling your, your husk back because if you've got Diplodia ear rot, you're going to start seeing your uh, almost like a mummified uh, ear with the husk because the husk is actually going to be suctioned onto that ear. Um, and it's gonna, it's the the husk is actually gonna bleach. And once you pull that back, you're just gonna see pretty much a mat of uh, the like a black, uh, a white to grayish brown, and sometimes black mold. Um, this is gonna be on and between the kernels, usually starting at the base of the ear. And then I'm gonna show a picture in a minute. But when you break that open. Um, you'll see black pycnidia, which is like your telltale sign that you've got diplodia. Um, one of the, a little bit of a silver lining here is that diplodia ear rot is not associated with any mycotoxins in the U.S. Um, though it's not associated with any mycotoxins, this ear rot can impact some uh, yield and nutritional value for the feed. Also, diplodia ear rot uh, can make the kernels and the cobs more friable, which is ground up during co combining and can result in higher levels of broken and foreign material. So once again, uh, hybrid selection for diplodia ear rot, um, field management, avoiding that continuous corn, tilling, tillage in some years to uh, put that inoculum underneath the soil surface, and then a crop rotation can be done for soybean and cotton. Um, and then reducing that, that plant stress, uh, weeds, foliar disease, the happier the plant, the more healthy the plant is, the, the better it can kind of fight off of these uh, ear rot pathogens. To summarize all of this information, you want to start scouting your fields to identify ear rots before harvest. If the ear, ear rots are identified, you need to prioritize affected areas and harvest them early. You want to keep the grain uh, segregated to avoid mycotoxin contamination of non-infected grain. Dry down is very important for silage and harvested grain. Even after the crop is out of the ground, the fungi can produce mycotoxins. So recommendations are to store below 15 for short term, but 13% uh, for long term storage. Reminder that drying and storing this grain does not get rid or destroy uh, the fungi or the mycotoxin, but it will stop the production of both. Preventative management for all ear rots are critical. Um, selecting the less susceptible hybrids if you can, reducing that residue in the field, crop rotation when possible, and then reducing that plant stress. Um, and as you can see, I added early planting uh, to this if possible. We know this year early planting was not really possible, so sometimes it is what it is, but early planting can also help with uh, ear rots. And so just for time's sake, I'm, I'm just gonna bring this slide up for honorable mention. Uh, this is our less common rots that occur here in Tennessee, as well as our not rots. You can check these out in a publication that's gonna be up uploaded to UT um, field crop guide soon, uh, but just some honorable mentions um, and fun rots to look at. So I know that I've talked years off today about ROTS, but I want to mention some other resources that are available uh, for other crops. Um, we have our UT crops uh, field guides at guides.utcrops.com. 
Um, a good way to keep up to date about what's going on currently is to actually look at our newsletter or our blog site. Um, we also have databases for all the varieties. Um, and then also a good, a good resource to, to contact is definitely your county agent for additional health. They're a plethora of knowledge. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, if you've got any questions, you can email me or Dr. Kelly um, or follow us on Twitter. So thank you guys. And I really hope you're enjoying uh, Mylan No-Till 2022.